Uh, I'm a CTO and service manager. I've been doing this for about eight years or so. Uh, we're currently undergoing our first SOC 2 certification to be fully vetted. And uh, yeah, let's get started. Uh, cybersecurity, it's, it's huge, it's everywhere, and it's kind of a buzzword. Uh, it's everything is, uh, everything revolves around it. You know, you're 10 years ago, it wasn't as big of a deal. Threats weren't nearly as uh, effective as they are now, but today it's a huge deal and it affects every piece of uh, every business. Uh, in 2019, there's been a lot more cyber security incidents that affect all kinds of businesses, not just wind farms, not just dental offices, not just hospitals. Uh, we're, uh, the city of Baltimore was attacked uh, with a ransomware infection. It took millions of dollars to pay to fix. The year before, uh, Atlanta it took six months to fix after a ransomware infection, and I think tens of millions of dollars. Uh, Capital One, they were compromised with a very, very, very easy to fix vulnerability. Somebody left default password, open ports, in a web server in the cloud. And uh, now 106 million people's data was compromised and breached. Uh, not only that, after that, Capital One purged all of their cybersecurity team. Uh, the next day, you actually, about a week after the, that was all announced, if you got on Indeed, you would have seen 40 jobs for cybersecurity directors, cybersecurity analysts, IT technicians, all at Capital One. Uh, so not only do these kind of things affect the business, the, 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 the bottom line, they also affect people and their jobs. And uh, you know, I can't, uh, I can't imagine that it would be that pleasant to have to go fire 40, 50, 60 people for anybody. So uh, there's been government agencies, schools, hospitals hacked. Uh, there was a compromise in Texas about two months ago where 39 different municipalities were compromised. Uh, all that data deleted or encrypted or effectively lost, or at least hard to access for a few days while you recover from your backups. This is kind of an idea of a DDoS map. These are where, just as uh, about two weeks ago, well, actually, no, it's just last week, uh, where attacks are coming from, where bulk attacks are coming from, I guess I have a laser pointer. Uh, uh, bulk attacks are coming from China and going to all kinds of locations. These kinds of things are scary. They're, uh, and you can't do anything, you can't prevent them from occurring to you. Uh, are industrial control systems and SCADA systems vulnerable to cyber attacks? Well, it's a computer, so yes. Uh, now you can harden them, you can, uh, you can try to protect them, but they're always gonna be vulnerable. There's always, there's always a weak point in the chain. Um, in 2015, the Ukrainian power grid was attacked by Russia. Uh, not only did it cut power to substations, did it, not only did it leave people without power, it was orchestrated by spear phishing, by email. Uh, that's something that everybody uses email every day. Uh, if you have, uh, if you, if you have email and you click a link inside of this email, next thing you know, you get malware and you don't even know it for a week, two weeks, three weeks, a year. It just, it really depends. And, uh, something so mundane as opening your email can cause an outage, can cause people to be without power, let alone the business itself to be affected. That was a few years ago. Uh, everybody knows technology changes extremely fast. Uh, you'd think that we're better now. Last month, well, two months ago now, there was a nuclear plant in India that was, a, that was breached. This just came out about two weeks ago. Uh, the network is air-gapped, meaning that network is actually not connected to any other network. It actually doesn't have internet access. Somebody, and this obviously, we don't know exactly what happened yet, this is still new, but they thought, my network's offline, I'm secure, they're not gonna exfiltrate data, 
they're not going to get into my system. They still did. From that, we do know that they not only got into the system, they then took data from the system and uploaded it to the cloud or uploaded it to uh, their um, parent company, in this instance, North Korea. Uh, this is, or at least that's what it says so far. Like I said, this is uh, hard to prove yet. But they took sensitive or potentially proprietary data and exfiltrated it and are going to hopefully, I think their plan is to use it in North Korea. The same malware was used to attack the Indian Space Research Organization. That is a, uh, that's, pretty, that's pretty effective malware. Most likely it, uh, I mean, it was able to infiltrate a nuclear facility which is not a low impact wind farm asset. Um, it was also able to infiltrate a air gapped facility, meaning an offline facility. Nobody clicked on an email inside of that facility to pull that malware in. Somebody had to get into it. Um, but then, not only that, it also hit the Indian Space Research Organization. That's, the, that's effectively India's NASA. Every year, the risk gets worse. Um, sophisticated attacks are the toughest. They're the hardest to prevent. They're the hardest to see that it's happening. If you're a target for one of those, it's extremely hard to know. Any advanced persistent threat, something that uh, they're watching you, they're targeting you, they're looking out for, you know, if somebody wants to go after a wind farm, maybe they want your data. Maybe they want your customer list. Maybe they just want to screw with you. <laughs> If they really want to, they can. Um, a lot of people think that there will be a critical attack on actual infrastructure, not just a small one-off, not a single wind farm, but a whole group of wind farms or a dam or a nuclear plants, for instance. I mean, it's already happened in India. They're almost half or over half of people say that they've had a shutdown because of some type of incident, whether that's ransomware, whether that's a DDoS, a denial of service, uh, whether that's a, uh, a disaster, things like, you know, things you can't really prevent, you know, Fukushima or a tsunami, that's kind of hard to event. A quarter think that or have been impacted by nation state actors, North Korea, Russia, Ukraine. Insider threats are huge. They are, um, that's going to be the majority of your threats, though. That's something we haven't really talked about yet. The rise of, uh, of sophisticated attacks is probably the biggest challenge. They're hard to detect. They're hard to know they're occurring. And they're extremely hard to prevent. Uh, when you have a, an event, not only do you have to detect it, but you also then have to remediate it. You have to take the necessary steps to fix it, patch it, make sure it doesn't happen again. Uh, these are extremely, extremely tough circumstances, and they do require people that know how to do that. Uh, when you have a system, like a lot of SCADA systems, that each plant is a little bit different. Each system does something a little bit different. Somebody wrote software this way for this plant. Somebody wrote software this way for that farm. Um, that becomes even harder because then you can't just bring in one person. Now you have to have people that know, okay, how is this code working? How does this work? Why did this happen? It becomes extremely uh, time intensive and to do an exhaustive kind of search for any kind of malware or anything like that. And then, you do all of that, and you still don't know if they got your data. You don't know if they were able to pull your data out, use your proprietary, your company's proprietary information in order to better themselves or to uh, have gain. A little bit later on, uh, somebody's going to be presenting on NERC SIP uh, 0307 updates things about transient, uh, transient cyber assets. I mean, some of the biggest things are 
a lot of this stuff hasn't been required for low impact facilities before. Uh, the are they are uh, you know there's some really really standard security precautions that haven't been required before and they're going to be required soon. Uh, things like making sure laptops are scanned, things like making sure that, hey, I don't bring a malicious device on your network and plug it in, and potentially infiltrate or exfiltrate your data. I don't potentially or accidentally, whether inadvertently or purposefully, take down a system that is critical and is going to require a, uh, you know, some type of operational downtime. And that obviously is, uh, as everybody in here knows, I'm assuming, but that goes into effect in January. And a nice blank slide for effect. Uh, why would you worry about that? I mean, you can't really control what Dan brings on your network, uh, but you can. Because whatever I bring in your building or whatever I bring into a turbine or whatever I bring anywhere, you can say, don't. You can say, we need to do this. Um, the, uh, and quite frankly, it's not safe. You don't know what's on a device. About five years ago, well, four years ago, um, there was a hack on iPhones, on iMessage. Specifically, the protocol Apple to Apple uses when you send a text to me with an Apple phone. A specifically crafted message you know, who knows what it was, they don't really release that. Five, six, seven, eight, nine. If I send that to Tim, it instantly will uh, compromise his phone. Give me system access to his phone. Uh, anything that he has, pictures, text messages. Apple goes through a big, long, drawn out campaign over the last year to tell everybody that their texting is secure, that it's encrypted. I think there were some stupid commercials with this lady like uh, sitting at a at a, like, a nail salon, giggling and laughing, and nobody knows what she's talking about. Same thing, except for now I have access to Tim's phone. I can see all of his pictures. I can see all of his messages. So not only does this, do these kind of attacks affect devices, computers, they also attack and affect devices that we all carry in our pocket every day, that we taught that that we take to random networks, that we use at home, that we use at work, that we use on vacation. It's a, it's kind of a, it's a big, big changing threat landscape. 10 years ago, that wasn't a problem. Everybody had flip phones and they called and you could do T9 texting where you have to click 14 times to get an S. Uh, now, you can do whatever you want with your phone. I mean, they're, they're more powerful than some computers. There's laptops that you can go buy at Best Buy today that are less powerful than the best phones. Pretty crazy. <laughs> this is another reason why you have to worry about what people bring in your network. A couple months ago, uh, or earlier this year, uh, a woman tried to, I think, they, what, I think they said she was a North Korean uh, state actor or something, tried to infiltrate the Mar-a-Lago resort. Uh, with and he had and she had USB drives that had malware. She had phones, several phones, with active data connections, so that she could exfiltrate data with whatever she whatever she was able to do. She was arrested and didn't make it. Uh, it'd be nice if you caught everybody that was going to do those kind of things. A smart thermometer, smart thermostat, smart anything. They are able to compromise that and they were able to use that to, uh, to gain a foothold in a casino network to then pivot and attack their uh, attack kind of like their VIP list. I mean that would be kind of sad. A casinos are extremely private and a thermometer and a fish tank allowed them to pivot in <laughs> and hack their VIP list. Um, and that's just, that's just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, in 2014, the biggest casino chain, Las Vegas Sands, and all of its subsidiaries was attacked by state actors, supposedly from Iran. And they were able to take down almost all of their systems. The IT, and, the IT staff there unplugged it from the network 
That was the only way they were able to even continue operating. And uh, same thing, that VIP list, all that data was exported. So now, somewhere on the dark web, you can go buy Las Vegas Sands VIP list, all of their high roller gamblers and all their information. An insulin pump, like, an insulin pump is a smart device now and can be compromised. That's, that's crazy. That can kill somebody. Juice jacking. This is a newer one, but it's theoretically, it's very, very simple. You go to the airport, plug in your phone to power it up before a long flight to Netflix or what you downloaded from Netflix beforehand. And instead of powering your phone, which is going to power your phone too, it's also pulling data from your phone because somebody found a way to install, you know, credit, you know, credit card skimmers, like gas pumps, that's a big deal. Same thing, except for now, instead of skimming credit cards, they're skimming your phone data. So if you don't have proper security precautions, now they can take data right off your phone at the airport. You're not even connected to the Wi-Fi. There's a lot of transient devices. Uh, USB drives, thumb drives. I've, uh, I've always wanted to see somebody go spread a bunch of thumb drives in a parking lot and watch how many of their employees go plug them in. People are going to. People are going to go see what's, what's, in the, what's on it. You know, hey, this is cool. Let me plug it in. And uh, that's all it takes. You don't have to execute a program. You don't have to download something. All you have to do is take that drive, plug it into your computer, and now bad actors are off to the races. Uh, CDs. Same thing. Every Windows PC does auto run. You pull a disc, throw it in your di you find a disc, you want to see what's on it, what's on this DVD, plug it in your work computer, auto run. Now there's, now there's an application running. Now you could be infected. SD cards. We use them for our cameras, we use them for our phones, store video on them. Same thing. Store files. Floppy disk, well, yeah, I don't know. I, I don't think anybody uses floppy disks anymore, but it could. It could. Uh, a few years ago, the CIA used floppy disks for security through obscurity because nobody could read it because nobody had a floppy disk reader. Your laptop, obviously. Um, that's the biggest thing. Every engineer or every tech that's going to come out, whether they're a wind tech or they're, they're coming out to troubleshoot something, they're all going to have some type of device. A laptop so they can plug in. Uh, they, uh, a laptop they can plug in. An iPad so that they can do remote troubleshooting. Anything like that. Those are the biggest ones. There is a ton, ton, ton. I mean, there, there isn't even a number for the amount of malware that's out there and available that they could have on these computers. So you have to protect yourself from it. Any kind of USB dongle. You could think it was a license key. When, the, when USB dongles use license keys, uh, you plug it in and it has files on it that it downloads and runs a little application so that you can make sure that you can use your access control system. A lot of times those have license keys on dongles, or they used to. So just so you can open your doors, you plug this new thing in that you got in the mail and you thought it was from your access control provider as a new license, but in reality, it's malware. And it came from who knows where. The cell phone. I mentioned how iPhones can be hacked, uh, or how any phone can really be hacked. It's a computer. Uh, but one of the biggest things is that it is also an LTE modem. It's, you know, it has 3G, it has 4G, and I mean, it's soon. It'll have 5G. Uh, it means you can get data off-site without having to ever touch the internal firewalls. A lot of times, people aren't even gonna know that you're exfiltrating that data because it isn't going across their network. You're pulling it into your phone, and your phone then uploads it without you even knowing it. And this can happen with or without the technician's knowledge. And that's why those things are extremely important and why transient cyber assets are a big, big, big part of the new uh, NERC SIP regulation. Why do we have to worry about it at all? Well, I mean, there's a lot because there's so much. Uh, you, have, you have to worry about every little piece of every bag that comes in your building of every uh, thing that a technician brings with them in their pocket every day. But also, 
you have to get it right 100% of the time. Any bad actor only has to be successful once. The, uh, it's really, really tough to, uh, to prevent absolutely everything. You get a deluge of traffic, of attacks. Check your, I mean, obviously everybody looks at their junk mail occasionally. Uh, don't click anything in your junk mail. But uh, if you were to actually see, you see a bunch of spam and their Russian brides and their, uh, oh, hey, click this ADP invoice uh, for, you know, but you've never used ADP in your life. Uh, but that's just stuff that gets through the real spam filter. If you saw the amount of emails that you actually get that don't pass Google's checks or Microsoft's checks or Barracuda's checks or whatever you're using for email, you'd be shocked at how many, are, how many attempts there are. Inside threats. Those are threats that are inside your building already. You, me, your people. Uh, those are some of the hardest to avoid and they're things you have to have. You can't, I mean, until the day comes where we can run every business with robots, we're gonna have people and people are prone to make mistakes. Outside threats. Those are threats like we talked about. Email, malware, and, and email's an inside threat too because if people click emails, it can introduce malware. Uh, then you have operational threats. Threats that affect your business, that affect the day-to-day -day operation of, of running the wind farm, of running the plant. This is actually a uh, this is actually a slide from my network this morning in my office. Uh, it's something I like to think of as just locking your doors and windows. You're not going to go on vacation and uh, leave your door unlocked or leave your windows open, right? I mean, you're not going to do that. It's just kind of common sense. This is a this shows we had eighty thousand attempts to access our network from countries that we don't allow communication from, just in the last 24 hours. Um, of that, there was 3,300 different sources. So people are trying 20, 30 times to get in, to see what they can do, to poke and prod and see what <laughs> vulnerabilities you have and what can they exploit. Um, and this is, this is extremely easy stuff to take care of that not everybody does. You don't need to allow traffic to China. You don't need to allow traffic to Russia or probably anywhere in Africa. Uh, there's very few. Uh, some of us have some need to send traffic to Denmark. Some of us have uh, need to send traffic to maybe Canada. It just, you know, it kind of, it's, it's case by case. But the reality is, is that if you're not at least blocking this much traffic, you're looking for a needle in a haystack for that one time that they're right. At least this gets rid of 80,000 attempts that you have to sort through. 9,000 of these, these specific attempts were actually from known bad actors. These are, these are uh, networks that are on known block lists that are, on, that are already known. People know that these guys are bad. And if you aren't watching for it, if you're not protecting it, you're not going to see it. They're going to be able to at least, maybe they're hitting a web server that you have. Maybe they're just hitting your firewall and your SSL VPN connection. Um, but they know you're there. And then they can force traffic down it. They can use, like that DDoS map in the beginning, they can use traffic to shut you down. Maybe they can't infiltrate you, but they can at least make it extremely painful for you to work. I mean, if you can't watch YouTube, you can't get your job done. It's sometimes. Uh, outsider threats, phishing attempts, spear phishing attempts, ransomware, crypto mining. Those are also all inside threats, too, because they still require somebody to do something wrong, to somebody to let that get on the network. Insider threats can be malicious. It could be, you know what? I feel like doing something stupid today. Uh, it can be negligent. Well, that might be the stupid one, too. 
it could be, you just didn't, they just didn't think about it. They are like, oh, you know what? They're going through their emails. They were on vacation for two weeks. They've got 500 emails and there's clicking, reading, clicking, and they don't pay attention to that. That, that domain is not from technologize.com. It's from technologies.com. And I just clicked a link. I thought it was Dan, but it's really not. It's who knows who and people. Sometimes people just don't know. People pick up a flash drive in the parking lot and they're like, hey, this is cool. What's on it? Uh, you know, there might be something good on it. Uh, I've heard stories of people using it for, uh, you know, they'll, they'll put like, somebody will write like payroll on the flash drive or on the USB drive and just leave it somewhere. And then people's interest is picked. They're kind of like, huh, this sounds fun. Let's look at this. Uh, and when they do, obviously, it's, it's a big problem. This, these can have a wide range of effects. They could take control, at least in wind farms, they could potentially take control of generation if they got far enough in your network. Uh, they could destroy reporting. They can take down devices that send how much you're actually generating out. That can cost you money. It can cost you money in potentially maybe fines if it happens. It cost you money potentially in not being able to fulfill an order as it comes in. And they can also exfiltrate data. If they get in and they send that data out, you, you, your data might be proprietary. I mean, well, we all can find out what turbines everybody's using, but maybe some of the things you're doing, maybe some tweaks you've made to get uh, a bit better generation, maybe you want that to be private. Maybe you don't want uh, potentially file shares or customer information or even employee information to get out there. Covering your basics. Always have firewalls, obviously. Uh, you want to put it at the edge of the network. So if anybody's still using an Adtran router as a primary edge device, please get rid of it. Uh, you want to put firewalls, even if they're the same firewall, anything between networks. Your critical infrastructure needs to be segmented and you need to have rules that block traffic. That way, at least, if your operations network is compromised in some way, your SCADA network is not. Uh, you want to have AV on all computers. You want to have AV on all computers that come in with, uh, with a vendor, with anybody who's doing any work for you. You want to look at your traffic You want to, with a SIM. You want to see, hey, what is happening on my network that, uh, that I can maybe make educated guesses on how I need to proceed and protect myself from other threats. You want to encrypt all your remote access traffic. Anything that's coming in or out of this network, you want to make sure it's private and it stays secure. Patching. I think there's, some, there's numbers out there. 30% of, of vulnerabilities that are found and exploited are because people don't patch. They don't do Windows updates. It's too inconvenient to reboot their computer. It's too inconvenient to, uh, to set up and approve patches. That's a huge, I mean, that's easy, big red flag. Microsoft publishes patches every month, and they publish patches, shoot, I mean, now it's like every day. Uh, utilize NIST. That's, that's the reason the cybersecurity framework is out there. NERC SIP is a lot based on NIST. And you want to train your employees. There you're going to be your weakest link in most of these scenarios. So tell, so you need to teach them, don't use flash drives you find on the ground. Don't click emails you don't, you don't recognize. And then you can go beyond that. You can go after threats. You can do vulnerability assessments. You can do pen testing. You can force multi-factor authentication. That doesn't fix every problem. It doesn't prevent everything from happening but it's an extra layer. It makes you a little bit less of a target, a little bit harder to compromise. You can take a look at what bad actors are doing and hopefully prevent, and pre prevent them from making lateral moves into your network or pivoting around your network if they ever get in. You could do managed detection. You could pay for a SOC. You can have somebody monitoring your network 24-7, and that way if there is something that happens at 2 a.m., because cybersecurity events or cybersecurity vulnerabilities and breaches don't happen at 10 a.m. after we've had coffee. They happen 
at 1 a.m., you know, and that's when we get that phone call that everything's broken, and that's not, not pleasant. You can review dark web. You can take a look at doing packet inspection. Uh, obviously, you do stateful packet inspection in your normal firewall, but this would be deep packet inspection, really sandboxing and seeing what things are doing. What's required? Do you know your system? Do you know the pieces? You don't have to know everything. You don't have to know every IP address. But you have to know that you have separate networks. Do you have firewalls? Do you have a plan to secure the network? Uh, what are you going to do to, uh, to implement that plan? Are you going to outsource it? Are you going to insource it? Are you going to bring somebody in-house to do it? Does everybody know how to do that? Does everybody know what their job is? And quite frankly, do you have the capabilities to do that? Steps for better cybersecurity starts right now. You can protect. Do the Windows updates. Do the, do the AV. Make sure it's updated. Keep your training current. Make sure that your staff knows what could happen if they do this. Not only is the plant potentially going to be affected, but their job could be affected, and that would really suck. Uh, somebody clicks on an errant email, and now they're the problem. They're the reason that this happened. Detect. Watch what's happening on your network. See what's happening and know what shouldn't be happening and respond. How are you going to respond if some type of incident happens? Are you going to be able to remediate it? Are you going to put a plan in place to remediate it? Are you going to, do you know who you're going to hire if you have to remediate it? And that's it. Is there any questions? What's the best way to protect, like, against phone threats on your phone? <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? Don't have a phone. Uh, the, the, you know, it's a tough. That's a tough one. Uh, it's uh, a lot of the same stuff applies when it comes to that. Don't connect to shady. Don't connect to shady networks for sure. Uh, you know, when it comes to like that, what I was talking about, like the iPhone thing, that's been patched. That unless your phone's five years old, it's not going to happen. Uh, but don't don't install apps you don't need. Don't leave stuff you don't need. Don't, uh, don't go to a coffee shop and connect to their Wi-Fi. Uh, and I think the biggest thing is, I was in the Bahamas last year, and the Wi-Fi in the hotel was a big open network, meaning I could see everybody else in the hotel's Wi-Fi, and my wife tried to connect to it. And I almost I lost it. That was bad. Uh, but uh, the, just because you know anything you do on that potentially could be spied on, could be seen. Whether it's by the hotel themselves, and we're in a different country at this point, we don't know what they want to do with our data. I mean, are you protected in the United States? Yes, but as long as the NSA isn't watching, you know, and, but in another country, you really have no idea what's going on. So, yeah. Yeah. As a small operator, which I am, you know, I have to have contractors coming into my site. Mm -hmm. They bring in their own laptops. They want to hook up to the Wi-Fi. We're out in the middle of nowhere. What do we do? I mean, you know, I, I don't know anything about the speed, the health of their computer systems at all. They could say they have any vi virus software. I wouldn't know the difference if they did or didn't. That's a, it's a fair point. Um, I believe he's going to go over a lot of that. But um, in my just opinion, you've got to educate and find out at least how to check for it. See, you know, I mean, it's our responsibility uh, to see, to protect the network, whether, I mean, we know exactly what we're looking for or not. We still have to look at it and determine if, uh, you know, so, we, so I would say educate. Learn the, the major antivirus number, even if you just look up a list. Say, okay. And then when you say, okay, what antivirus are you using? He's like, Webroot, uh, Panda, Trend Micro, whatever. At least you understand, okay, and then go look for it. And you can go, you can inspect that. Uh, it comes with a lot of things. You want to inspect what you expect. Uh, you want to see that. You have to know where you're getting where you're getting your product from. I mean, you can. I mean, you can. Uh, uh, if you pick it up at a at a vendor booth, at a demo, or at a conference, you don't know, right? It's just in a big. It's in a bowl that you walk up, you drop a business card in. So now they have your information, and you have a charging cable. But don't use that kind of free stuff for critical things. Uh, that's a big thing, you know. If if you if you need a charging cable, order one. You know, order one from the manufacturer. Uh, you know, you can't really trust Amazon, but.
or just don't ever plug it into your computer. Just always yes. use you know. Yes. You know, you brought up another thing. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm constantly in the field taking pictures, bringing it back to my computer, mm -hmm. you know, plugging it in. Yep. You know, um, you know, the applications that people download on phone, I, I download very few, you know, on the computer, mm -hmm. like my work phone, a little bit on, more on my personal phone, but that's probably a huge one to be just to It is. The weekly there's there's announcements of apps that are removed from the Apple App Store or the Google Play Store that are that have malicious code in them and every time you you install an app now it asks you do you want to give this app permission to X or to Y or to Z to, to your photos to your contacts to your uh, messages read that don't just go yes 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 now I gotta play Candy Crush uh, read it and see what's what it's actually doing and know that hey this device is telling me what it can do. Why does a game need to be able to access my photos? Why does a game need to be able to access my contact list? Uh, you know, those are all, it, they, a lot of times they give you the red flags up front and we just ignore them. And that goes back to the people aspect. If we, if they tell us and then we ignore it, I mean, who reads all the fine print, the terms and conditions whenever you install anything on your computer? People. Saying no, does that automatically keep them from being able to access? Theoretically, it's at least a step in the right direction. You're not you're not at least handing them the key. You're at least making them go work for the key. So, yeah. Um, it sounds like we're losing the war. Uh, where do you see us in five years? Oh, I don't know. I think if you were able to predict, five. No, no. Well, yes and no. Right? You'll lose it on one front. You'll gain, you'll gain some, you'll gain some area. Maybe ransomware isn't a thing in five years. Uh, is our bad actors, our nation states, going to be a thing in five years? Absolutely. Um, the so maybe we win out. Maybe we defeat ransomware. Maybe we figure out a way to break strong encryption. I'm doubtful, but with quantum computing, probably. But then we'll just have even stronger ransomware because they'll have the same tools. So. I think there's going to be, there'll be changes, but it'll shift. We're worried about ransom. We're worried about spear phishing now. And it wasn't nearly a big of thing, as big of a thing 10 years ago. Uh, if I had to guess, I would say there's a lot of targeted attacks and advanced persi persistent threats. People getting a foothold in the network and then, uh, and then waiting six months, pulling everything they can, figuring out all these ways that they can ruin your day. And then... They execute. Will, will there ever be a day? When, oh, sorry. No, go, go ahead. ahead. Go ahead. Will there ever be a day when he just, just pays, pays me? It's no big deal. Oh, okay. When people will uh, be afraid to attack no. our network? No, 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 no. I mean, technically, in the United States, if you're if you're attacked, you could go to the FBI. Sure. You, chances are not going anywhere unless it was a really big attack. Nobody's gonna be afraid. There, there is a cyber. The cyber laws are so difficult to enforce, especially if it comes from outside the United States. So I don't think so. You, the cloud, uh, you know, we, a lot of us talk about the cloud. We go to the cloud. Oh, yeah, pushing everything in the cloud. It's great for capitalized costs. Moves everything to operational. But it's the same. It's an extension of your network, but it's in a cloud environment. So it's just as hard or harder. You can't physically go unplug it. You have to figure out a way to protect it as well. Uh, the other component is Microsoft and Google do not guarantee that they'll recover your data for you. If you look at if you look at fine print, they say you're responsible for it, not them. So you can't call Microsoft and say, "Hey, we got ransom in the cloud. Can you recover our data?" They may or may not help. So what's the best way to download backup through a floppy disk and stuck it in a box? <laughs> That's a good idea, actually. Uh, it would take a lot of floppy disks, though, at 1.44 <laughs> megabytes. Uh, you know, if it depends what you're. Well, it depends what your tolerance for risk is, and it also depends on how much you have. If you're talking about you want to have all your backup emails, you could download it onto a drive, encrypt that drive, and then store it in, you know, in a fire safe or yeah. off-site somewhere, you know, somewhere where it's going to be protected, and make sure it's encrypted, and don't write the encryption key on the bottom of it. That way, it's extremely easy to open. Uh, but then you can store that, and that gives you that backup, that PST file if you're using Outlook or any other type of file to download them. But you know, that's if you want to backup emails and stuff like that. Yeah, that's the best way, uh, or that's a that's a fine way. There are other services that can backup straight, 
uh, straight from Office 365, straight from Google into a separate cloud. But it's just like anything, you know, you don't want two internet connections for redundancy if they're on the same provider. You don't go to Charter and get two Charter, fire, or two charter internet connections because if one goes down, there's a good chance the other one is too. Same thing here, you wanna go off site. So if you're in, if you're in Google, uh, you wanna back up to a provider that puts you in a different infrastructure, in a different data center, in a different state, or you know, keeping the United States though. Anything else? Yeah. So recently, a month ago, we had a uh, NERC survey, basically to see uh, what we had for Chinese manufacturers of drones and of cameras, uh, which probably has a pretty high potential there to be cheaper. Um, so that's a little hanging fruit. Other low hanging fruit, I mean, you kind of scared me with the uh, thermometer for the aquarium. Right. You know, that, who would, who that scares, scares me. me. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, cameras are pretty obvious. Mm -hmm. uh, drones, maybe not so obvious. But any other low hanging fruit that we should go back and look at the, you know, do we really need this here, the smart device? Smart devices are low hanging fruit. Do you need it? Do you want it? And if you do need it and or want it, can you establish a way to protect it? Uh, also, I think looking at uh, devices you may be using that maybe you picked up at a conference or uh, USB drives that you have just laying around, you, you aren't sure, you know, I'm sure everybody in their skater room or somewhere has a bin or a box or even just a desk drawer that has a bunch of random drives in it, whether it's hard drives or USB drives or whatever. Do you really need them? Do you know where they came from? And if you do, that's, you know, it's okay because USB drives serve a great purpose, quickly transferring files back and forth, but they can just be exploited, just like anything can be. So I think any devices you have laying around that you don't use, either lock them up. Um, that way, you know, because stuff has a, has a habit of being misplaced or moved or go missing. And if people were to take a laptop that's a, a farm-owned laptop or a device, put malware on it when you aren't looking, and then set it back, you know, there's, there's that too. So I think making sure things are protected and secured. Uh, I'll just make a comment on that too. You'll see a lot more AI, artificial intelligence, in behavior analysis, in network uh, monitoring, and device monitoring. And there's a lot more popping up out there that's uh, relative to AI uh, and 24-7 security operations center operation centers who are plugged into systems to monitor and watch the AI and watch the behavior. And so instead of one particular device getting an alert, it can, it, it can connect the dots saying, hey, we're seeing something over here that over here might be normal, and over here that might be yeah, not abnormal, might be okay too. But together, using that AI is like, okay, wait, they're happening at the same time or, or occurring in this pattern, that tells us there may, by, there may be some bad actors going on. And the other thing would be is behavioral analysis uh, with that is, and that's really what you're talking about is, you're, you may re you remote into your server occasionally, right, during the day, but it's pretty rare for you to use RDP, or never happened, to use RDP to remote into a server at 1 a.m. or 2 a.m. And so what's going on there and looking at that and trying to be like, okay, this, something's not right here, and doing something about it, whether it's, um, whether it's shutting off the connection, whether it's reporting it, calling you, you know what I mean, that kind of stuff. So uh, it just sets off alarms. So. Okay. All right. Well, thanks, guys. Oh, do you have anything? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so... Um, so if, you're, if you still have, you know, just like an edge router, if you will, uh, you know, they don't have the same functionality that uh, some type of threat management device does, some type of next-gen firewall. And those firewalls, so like an Adtran router, for instance. I hate Adtran routers. They, they drive me nuts, but um, just from a network side. Uh, but they, uh, they have very, very limited rule sets. They can't look at what the traffic's really doing. They say, hey, this traffic's destined, destined for this device on this port. Okay, allow. Routers route traffic by design. That's how they're designed, that's what they do. If they can figure out a way to send that data to a device, it will do it. A firewall is designed to block traffic. So you have to explicitly 
allow traffic. You have to say, okay, you know what? I like traffic from this site. I like traffic from here to here. That's okay. Allow it. Um, and that's kind of where we're going with that is that a lot of times, you know, 10 years ago, uh, it was a router was good enough. Now it's not. You don't know what that data is doing when you're just using a router. You may be able to see where it's going, where it's destined, where it came from, and uh, like what service it's using. It's using SSH or it's using VPN or it's using something like that. But you don't really see what's going on with it. Whereas a firewall gives you more visibility. Okay, this device is flowing this much traffic for this long and it's never done that before. This device is creating an encrypted connection. Now I can't, now I can't snoop on that connection and see what they're sending. So that's where. <laughs> Under the keyboard. Uh, no, the, uh, well, you want to use, you want to use, I mean, the best way is just remember them, but that's obviously not, uh, not feasible. Uh, you know, if you're going to use some type of password manager, obviously you want it to be encrypted. Uh, you want it to be uh, protected with multiple levels of authentication. So if you're using a password manager, um, you want to have multi-factor authentication on it. Uh, you want to have an, a, a way to have, you know, your phone, you know, has everybody used multi-factor where you have like a token or they send you a text message when you want to, when you want to log in or something like that. You want to be able to prove that number one, I know my email address, I know my password, but I also know, or I also have this device. Now, can that be beat? Yes. It can, everything can be beat, but it at least starts that process. So I would say a secure password manager is the best way. And multi-factor is It's a great idea. I don't think it's really implemented um, uh, that that well, it, just purely because of the way that they're designed. Uh, you know, I mean, you have some some companies might have uh, access cards, and I'm going over time, but uh, some companies might have like access cards that go into laptops that allow connections. Some companies use tools like there's like Duo, and there's other softwares that you can use, which require you to authenticate with your phone, with your code, and your password in order to just log into your workstation. Um, outs I mean, I don't, I don't know, I don't see the day where every SCADA network for authentication has multi-factor. It'd be great because it would be a lot easier to at least protect the perimeter of it, but I, I think it's going to be a long ways off. Yes, sir. Dan gave a bunch of reasons why this is important. I'm going to add one more reason which uh, has uh, potential penalty. Do it. Yeah, and it'll be just like any audit. They'll be, they'll actually be after it, and they'll want documentation, and they'll want proof that my laptop's clean. Hey, Bjorn, my laptop's clean. Next time I bring it, so just you can take my word for it. Yeah. Yeah. I just have like, uh, I guess I have a question. Yes, sir. So I work for, uh, I work, at, and I'm looking at everything that you're presenting, and so we have an IT department, we have an IT security department. We have all these layers, right? And, and I'll say, I, I think in my head, that we have dedicated people and experts in these specific areas, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm out at the plant, okay? Mm -hmm. And I guess I have overall responsibility of the plant, right? And I entrust, I guess I'm assuming, mm -hmm. but I entrust that my company has robust programs in place to protect us mm -hmm. as well as they can, right? Yeah. Do you have any inside suggestion, maybe perspective is the word, right? Is there anything that you think I should be, I or other folks like myself should be keen into or asking once in a while or, or having a discussion once a year or some interval and and getting a glimpse into what these people are doing or not doing yeah. versus just having trust in them? Well, absolutely. You want to, uh, you want to make sure. So not, and it's not just you. It's not just a plant manager. It's everyone. It's, it's anyone at the plant. It's anyone that could have access. You can infiltrate networks. I mean, Puget Sound Energy, huge network. Uh, I grew up in Western Washington. They're all Western Washington. Uh, and all the way up to New Halem and the dams, or at least they used to. I don't know if they are anymore, but regardless, 
you can, it's not just any one, any, if there's any break in the chain, they'll figure it out. If somebody is coming on site and you're on vacation and whoever's filling in for you as site lead or is, is watching the site when you're gone, you know what? I don't think Dan's laptop has, has malware on it. You know, that's, maybe I'm targeted. Maybe I was targeted, now I'm infected and I'm bringing this infected uh, laptop on site and, uh, and I'm a third party, I'm, you know, um, so a little different situation, but regardless, you still, I've been out there a lot. You trust me. You don't think I would do that. And if I say, yeah, man, yeah, it's updated. Yeah, we're good. Uh, you're, somebody just signs off on it. So it's just a matter of making sure that nobody breaks the chain, that everybody follows the procedure, regardless if you trust me or not. You always sign in. Everybody that comes on the site is supposed to sign in. And uh, there's, a, there's a reason for that. It's to say I was here. Whenever you open the skater room, you got to sign in just to say, I went in. Um, so that's really where I think it is, is make sure that everybody's following the procedures annually, every six months. Have, have quick cybersecurity trainings. Have quick just kind of conversations, even if they aren't trainings, but have conversations about what could happen if you let somebody in with a bad device, with an infected device, if you don't check. That would be what I would say. Um, as far as that, you probably do have a team of great people. But it just takes one person to fall asleep on the job to screw over everything. Thank you. Yeah. Cool. Thank you, Dan. Yep. Thank you.